So let me tell you how I'm a horrible father. I, t I like to take long naps on the weekends while my kids wander around aimlessly around my house. And there was about three weeks ago, this happened, where I fell asleep and I heard three girls screaming in my basement. So I rush down the stairs, peer around the corner, and I see one of my twin five-year-olds holding a steak knife in the air and then pink red fluids dripping down her arm. And I'm thinking of John Carpenter's Halloween 1980 movie. She screams and she sees me. Her twin sister, Raven, turns to me and says, Dad, are you mad at us? Because we used the adult knife this time. And I don't know where the third girl came from because she disappeared in my house as not my child while I was sleeping. As Raven says this very slowly and cautiously, I'm reminding myself I might be raising serial killers at this point. I look at what's happened in my basement. I've got a disemboweled watermelon with pieces of watermelon on the walls, on the floor. They're crazy straws on the table, clearly they're sucking the juice out. They're, all of their dresses, that were once, which were once white, are now red, it looks like a bloody massacre. And I know by the parent handbook exactly what I'm supposed to do. Because it's been passed down from generations, from Great Depression grandfathers, exactly what you're supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be livid. I'm supposed to be screaming, I'm supposed to be punishing someone, everyone, anything around me. The fact is my authority has been usurped by a bunch of five-year-olds while I was napping. And I look at these girls, three girls under five, and they are so prideful of what they've accomplished. <laughs> and so what did they do in this situation? They were intrigued by knives. We're all intrigued by weapons, so they're no different than us. They experiment with this in this safe, not really safe, pretty dangerous situation here. You've got three kids with steak knives by themselves in the basement. Again, this is not a good situation to retain a marriage for long-term happiness. <laughs> they discover that they have these latent skills that they're developing right then and there without an adult being there. In an uncertain, unpredictable, absurd world that we live in, at this moment, they're developing strengths, they're recognizing what they're capable of, initiative, courage, the ability to use the knife effectively, and I can't help but not get angry. And I have temper problems, just like most dads do. But I can't get angry. I'm really admiring what they're doing here. And I think what this was, it was a lesson to me of exactly what it requires to create a creative, innovative society. Kids as role models. Here's what you have here. If you want people to do good work, which is the lifeblood of every single organization, every school, every company, every couple, you give them a map. You give them the paint by numbers. You tell them exactly what to do, have them do it, they come back to you. It'll be okay. Sometimes it'll be really good. But if you want inspirational work, if you want creativity, if you want innovation, you give them a template, but really loose and you give them tons of autonomy to explore through their own path, their own strengths, their own potentials, to find out how are they going to get to the outcome. Not knowing yourself what's going to happen, not knowing if they're going to fail, not knowing how to deal with your anxiety of the fact that when it comes down to it, you're responsible if they succeed or fail, and they're probably going to fail a number of times. And as parents, we have to have the courage to say yes to our children as much as possible. And as leaders, whether it's in a couple or in an organization, we have to have the courage to start saying yes and giving people the freedom to experiment and be bad scientists with what they do. Because if you value creativity, if you value innovation, if you value personal growth, if you value well-being, you have to allow people to be curious and act on that curiosity and explore. That's what I want to talk about today. Tens of thousands of people have been researched, and they've been asked the same question. What's the fundamental objective of your life? Not your goal, not your striving. What is it that you live for? And what we find around the world is 80 to 90% of people say to be happy. And I'm here to tell you something that's pure heresy. It is a bad objective to have for your life. At the end of this talk, I'm going to give you an alternative that's better. Here's my mantra. You, can, you, can, you can't always be happy, but you can nearly always be profoundly aware and curious. 
Happiness is not like a knob that you can turn up and down whenever you want to. The pharmaceutical industry is attempting this. There's a legion of social workers and psychologists, personal trainers, dieting books, trying to just say, hey, listen, here's the knob for your happiness. Let's just ramp it up. Now you're happy. Now what are you going to do? As a public speaker who's married a thousand times behind the stage before I get in front of a room full of a thousand people, and my wife will turn to me, or a friend, or some random person behind the stage, Todd, just relax. Relax and smile. They'll love you. And I say to them, you are so wise. That's such amazing advice, because I would have never thought of that before <laughs> until you said it. Oh my God, all I have to do is just say relax, and that's it. Holy shit. We don't have these knobs. You can't just turn happiness up and down. But curiosity is a mindset that we can wield like a laser at any point in time, and we forget about this because we think we know everything there is about curiosity, and we don't. So forget happiness for a second. Can curiosity help us become psychologically flexible? Now, that's a jargony term from somebody who's been studying well-being for 15 years and has been a psychologist for 15 years. So let me break this down by focusing on the opposite of being flexible. Here's the story that I hear traveling on airplanes, and unfortunately, because I'm groggy, tell the person next to me that I'm a psychologist, so I hear all their life's woes. <laughs> Is I hear the same story over and over again. As soon as I get rid of my anxiety, I'm going to talk to my boss and get that promotion. As soon as I eliminate my self-doubt and my insecurities, I'm going to write that book I always wanted to. As soon as I handle all of my insecurities and my baggage from my childhood, all that rejection, all the times I've been cheated on, then I'll be ready to commit into a long-term relationship. And I think about those people of how much their ambitions came to life over the course of their lifetime. And I imagine at the end of their lives, having this 30-page autobiography with nothing in it that's trite, contrived, and appallingly boring. Because the fact is, you can't eliminate anxiety. You don't want to. You're not going to get rid of self-doubt. You will not get rid of your childhood baggage, and you don't need to, and you don't want to. In fact, in another talk, I'll tell you, you specifically want to harness those negative, uncomfortable states. The ability to pursue what we care about despite the presence of pain and anxiety. That's what psychological flexibility is about. And I'm going to suggest that we've gone, tried all these different styles of interventions to try to get rid of anxiety. You've heard it today. Avoid fear. Eliminate the things that you're afraid of. Get rid of your insecurities and self-doubt. Get in front of this room, stand in front of a thousand people. I'm going to avoid it, suppress it, and hide all my anxiety. You're not going to see the fact that there's tension in my legs because I'm going to wobble my knees a little bit. So you don't notice it there. And I'm going to hide it. And because of that, I'm going to be imprisoned by it. And my mind is going to enslave me. But I'm going to suggest that curiosity will provide a backdoor route to dealing with these uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. It's easier, it's more enjoyable, and it's more effective. And we're going to do it right now. We're going to do an exercise. This is for intellectual slackers, because you don't have to get up, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> Please, do not say anything, because you're going to think to yourself some very weird things right now. As a happiness researcher, I'm always asked, if you could give people one bit of advice about how to live a well-lived life, what would it be? And my answer is always the same the ability to tolerate pain. So here's what I want you to do. And it shouldn't be hard. I want you to think of, nobody beats you down more than your own mind. And I want you to think of that ugly, self-critical thought that creeps up on you when you least want it to appear. And I want you to turn it into a short sentence, such as, I am blank. I am a fraud. What the hell am I doing up here? You guys should be up here. I'm no expert in anything. I'm an anxious person, I'm unlovable, I'm unattractive, I'm getting old, and my pecs are getting saggy. <laughs> I'm lonely. I'm not that funny. You know your ugly thought. Do not say it out loud. For 10 seconds, here's what I want you to do. In a short sentence, I am blank. I want you to marinate in it. 
Bathe in that ugly thought. Do not challenge it. Sit with it for 10 seconds. I want you to add something in front of that statement. I'm having the thought that I am blank. And I want you to slowly say that to yourself for five seconds. I'm having the thought that I'm unattractive. I'm having the thought that I'm not interesting. Five seconds, really slowly. Let's add something else in front. I notice I'm having the thought that I am blank. I notice I'm having the thought that I am blank. Slowly for five seconds. What happens to that ugly, unwanted thought? It loses some of the sting. Some of the bite gets lost. 30 seconds, and I've created some distance between the thinker and the thought. I've helped you create some distance between the emotion and the feeler. Created some space where you can have these uncomfortable thoughts, but still have mental energy left over so that you can be in the present moment doing things that you care about. Psychological space, unhooking those ugly thoughts. So we look at them as what they actually are. You're not saying that you're ugly, truthfully, or unattractive. You, you're having the thought that you're unattractive, but that's not even accurate. You notice you're having the thought that you're unattractive. When we look at things as they are, when we turn curiosity inward towards our own mental events, we don't get rid of them. We change our relationship with them, that I can have these uncomfortable thoughts and every once in a while, they're going to hook me and grab me. I'll thank my mind for that thought and come back into the present moment. As opposed to, I'm going to eliminate them. I'm going to hide them. And then I'm ensnared by my brain. There's hundreds of these exercises using curiosity to wield greater tolerance for pain. Everything in this picture has been in your anus and every other orifice of your body. <laughs> and you think you're an expert of this stuff. This is sand magnified 250 times. <laughs> and I think that one of the reasons that we have so many problems, doctors make medical errors, within two to three years of a romantic relationship, passion, takes a nosedive is because our brain loves to label, categorize, and put things into boxes. This is great. This is stereotyping. This is horrible for your relationships. You think you know what they're going to say before they even talk. You think that when they do something that doesn't fit with your box and category for them, that it's a blip. Let's try that again. Look for the unfamiliar in the seemingly familiar. We don't recognize how much novelty there is right around this. This is sand. You ignore how beautiful, how mysterious, how terrifying this stuff is, that this is inside you, because we think we're experts. Here's my suggestion. You don't want to be an expert in anything, because as soon as you become an expert, you stop paying attention. And that's what happens to relationships. Friendships, romantic relationships work. You think you're an expert, you make mistakes. And not the glitches, the mistakes where people die and companies go south when it happens to it. When you have your friend that's really introverted and, it ends up, and you see them running a party with a really funny story. When you have your really sociable friend who says, I need some quiet time to conserve my energy and recharge my batteries. When you see your compassionate friend who meditates 20 minutes a day, five days a week, and they're pissed off and their middle finger is at every single person. These are the points, this is where the passion is. Instead of pushing that information and sweeping it under the rug, focus on the beauty of the complexity of human beings around you. 
Look for the unfamiliar in the seemingly familiar. If we're going to be explorers, being creative and innovative, it's a myth that we can do this by ourselves. We need safe havens. You need to have relationships where people will allow you to come to them and tell you. Come to them and you can confide in them that you feel anxious, you're unsure about yourself, you're uncomfortable, and they will not hold it against you. They will accept it and give you the energy to explore further again. And when you explore and do new things and grow as a person, you will change. You're gonna deviate from the person they once know. Will they accept the fact that the party animal in high school is now a profound lawyer who's the best at their craft? Are you around people that allow you to deviate, grow, and evolve? Or do you provide a safe haven for other people? Because without that, we do not have creativity and innovation. We've got solitude. So let me end with my new mission for your lives. This is what I see in the bookshelves. There's hundreds of these books. I don't know what your reaction is, but my reaction is always the same. It's, damn, it's a lot of pressure to be happy all the time. I think of CEOs of corporations that are telling their employees, we're going to bring in happiness consultants because I'm tired of seeing you guys sad and angry and disenchanted. I want happiness on your faces. And we've got parents that are saying to their 11-year-old kids, you're too old to cry. What's wrong with you? Be happy. That's what the book says. There's hundreds of them. What are you doing? <laughs> the pressure. So I've got an alternative. The building blocks for a well-lived life are moments. And in those moments, forget pursuing happiness. In those moments, be aware with an attitude of openness and curiosity and focusing on what matters, despite the presence of pain. And when you do this, you might catch happiness along the way, you might not. But here's the thing, you've got one life to live. Move things around, shift perspectives, do things that you normally wouldn't do. Experiment like a mad scientist and live a life well lived. Thank you.